Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Walker. I'm going to talk about uh, using access based access control for things beyond just access control, um, in particular to implement privacy and security policies. Um, I'm going to draw on my experience at my previous job at Google and my current job at Nuna, uh, both of which involved handling a lot of sensitive information and applying data handling policies. Um, unfortunately, the systems that uh, implemented this at both companies are proprietary, so I'm not going to be giving code snippets, things like this. Uh, this is more of a lessons learned talk. Um, I'm going to start by giving an overview of what attribute-based access control actually is. Uh, and then some of the aspects of it that are useful and things to uh, keep in mind when you're applying this uh, more broadly than just for access control. So to start, um, access control over the years has evolved a lot. Uh, originally, it was things like uh, physical switches on disks and you know, on media and, and devices uh, that controlled whether or not you know, write circuitry was engaged. So this was a property of a device. It wasn't attached to any particular data. Um, sometimes it was attached to media. Um, later on, the start, access control started being mediated by identity. Uh, a classic example of that is Unix permissions, where an access decision is made based on who you are, uh, what groups you're in, and what the permissions on a particular file or directory are. Um, this is still pretty uh, pretty simplistic, although it has uh, it has stood the test of time. It's still used pretty much everywhere. Um, business rules started to being being applied to access controls with role based access control, where instead of just as a function of identity the uh, access decisions are made as a function of what roles the user has or is assigned, uh, what authorizations are associated with this, those roles. Uh, this is often called RBAC or role-based access control. Um, group membership tests are often used as a version of this. Uh, the idea is you can change what groups someone's in without changing their identity. So as they move from role to role within an organization, uh, the authorization can follow with them. But even that gets to be a problem. Um, one of the things I've seen in a couple of organizations I've been part of is that group membership is used as a proxy for other kinds of attributes of the user or of their role. So for example, I might badge into an office in, in the US, I get put into the is currently in the US group and some authorizations follow along with that. I badge into an office in Europe, I get put into the is currently in Europe group. This mostly works, uh, but it is not something that uh, scales very well. Um, updating a large group database, across, especially across a very large organization, uh, can be slow. It can introduce consistency problems uh, and latency problems because any kind of global state, like a group, you know, a group membership list, uh, can take time to propagate. Um, and so, around the turn of the century. <laughs> uh, people started uh, saying, well, how can we incorporate more, that kind of context more directly? Uh, and so started looking at access control as a function of the attributes of the user, the data, the source and destinations of a computation, uh, the nature or purpose of a computation and other kinds of policy constraints. Um, the blanket term for this is attribute-based access control. And it first appeared around 2000. Uh, like any good piece of technology. There are many standards to choose from here. Uh, OASIS was sort of first out of the gate with XACML in 2001, which was a language for describing policies. Uh, was not actually a mechanism. It was more of a, you know, how to specify these things formally so they could be evaluated by, by an automated mechanism. Uh, NIST has put forth a standard uh, or publication about this. Um, Again, fairly abstract, covers uh, abstractions and vocabulary to use, things like that, to try and uh, you know, line up different specific systems and see how they correspond. Microsoft uh, has, a, has a mechanism for this most recently, and uh, there are many uh, private and proprietary systems as well. But they all have some common attributes. Uh, they all, the attributes fall into four main buckets in all of these systems. There's the subject. So that is who or what is doing the acting, uh, a person, uh, a, an automated role account, um, something like that, uh, some other system. 
Uh, there's an action, which is you know the computation being performed usually or access that is being requested. Um, there's the object, which is what access is being requested for, um, and then other context. Uh, this could be things like time of day, geographic location um, of, of any of the, or all of these, um, or, or other contextual information. Yeah, let's see. Um, to do this, two very, two different, different general approaches were, uh, were developed. Uh, one branch of this ended up putting additional attributes onto objects. So data objects, code objects, things like that. Uh, sort of as a generalization of permissions or you know, ownership tags, uh, things like that. This has a bunch of uh, pros. Uh, it can be fast. Um, rules can be evaluated right on the spot in line by examining the properties of you know, the data, the user, the container, things like that, right at the policy enforcement point. So it can be as effectively as fast as, an, as a permissions check. Um, and it's fairly transparent. If you look at the code that is you know, implementing this policy, uh, it will it'll often have the policy written out in code right there. You know, if this and this, then accept or reject uh, as the case may be. Um, these are also the cons. Um, because it's decentralized, updating one of these rules can be very painful. Uh, if the rules are written out in line as code, then you have to go change all of the code if the policy changes. <laughs> and even across a large code base, even with a lot of automated tools, this can take a while. And you can miss them. You end up with policy consistent problems. Even if you centralize it into something like a library or, or macros that are, in, that are included, um, this just makes it only a little easier. Uh, if a library, you still have to rebuild everything, push new binaries, things like that. And not every useful attribute is static. Um, not everything that you might want to know about a file, for example, uh, remains static over the course of its lifetime. Uh, same thing's true for data. And so that's where these things tend to fall down. It ends up being kind of a variation of the group membership test as a proxy for other kinds of attributes. The more general approach is a policy service where you bundle up all of the attributes of the data, the actor, the computation, and so on, and send them off to a policy service, which gives you a go, no go answer. Um, this has some advantages. The rules can be generalized and, and centralized. Um, they can take effect immediately if you need to do a rule change. Um, and dynamic attributes can be computed or looked up on demand. So you can represent things explicitly like, okay, if this person is in the engineering group and is within the US and the data is marked as US access only, then grant access. Uh, not that you don't have some of the consistency problems you do if you try to push these things out to group membership or static attributes. Uh, the disadvantages are that it's much slower. Uh, it's a remote procedure call or an, a an API request, things like that. And that means the service has to be reachable. You now have a distributed systems problem uh, with all of that, all that that brings along as far as latency, uh, tra traffic planning, uh, capacity planning, and so on. So these are two very different ends of the same spectrum. It turns out you need both. Um, object attributes are great for attributes that are static for the lifetime of an object. Uh, and need to be evaluated quickly. So a column in a row of a database, uh, an extended attribute on a file in a directory full of a lot of files, things like that. They're not so good as the, as the attributes get more abstract. And as you need to uh, enforce policies sort of at the computation level rather than the data element level. So, um, one way to think of this is that access is really a special case. Uh, it's a special case of questions like, should this computation proceed? Should this computation include this data? And those, the criteria for those questions are often more than identity or group membership or, or data classification. They can include things like purpose. Uh, is this for user interaction? Are you serving this data back to the user that provided it? Uh, is it for personalization? Are you building an ML model of you know, this user's actions so that you can tailor future responses to that user's uh, behavior? Is it for monetization? If so, is it individual or is it aggregate? 
Uh, is it for research purposes? Are you doing queries across a population and building a model or generating statistics or reports based on that? Uh, is it for security or anti-abuse? Anti uh, can you tell if this is uh, you know, someone a spam or is a real user or is a bot or things like that? Uh, and there are ancillary uses. There are, there are additional business uses that pop up uh, many times uh, if you know, once you have the capacity to do this kind of analysis over a lot of data, but that data may have restrictions on what it can be used for. Uh, jurisdiction is a common one. Um, and different countries have different rules. Um, but even jurisdiction is, is a function. It's not really a static attribute. You know, by analogy, if I'm a US citizen traveling in Europe, uh, am I under European jurisdiction or US jurisdiction? The answer depends on what policy it is. If it's a traffic law, it's wherever I happen to be. If it's something like, uh, can I bring this cheese home with me? <laughs> you know, Switzerland or France might be quite happy to sell me nice, delicious raw milk cheese. And as soon as I you know, land back in the US, US Customs and Border Patrol is gonna have a problem with that. So uh, even jurisdiction is thornier than it often seems up front. Um, similarly, there are public policy questions. Um, Public does not always mean unconstrained. We're used to thinking of that in the computer science community. It's like, well, it's, it's publicly readable. Therefore, there aren't any constraints on it. Well, you know, as companies like Google discovered with Right to be Forgotten and other companies have discovered when they used nominally public information to do computations that surprised users, either by for recommendations or uh, other kinds of analysis. Users have expectations about public information about them. Uh, this is a particularly showing up in the US around things like property records and tax records, um, some of which are, are public by design, but were never be designed, never been, they were never designed to be queried horizontally across a population all at once. Um, and they're internal policy applications. Um, Companies or organizations often have policies designed, in some cases, to keep honest people honest. Um, make sure that you can't do certain kinds of actions unilaterally. Um, a good example might be, okay, this kind of administrative access is permissible if the person requesting it is you know, a member of the customer service team and they are currently assigned a ticket related to this user's data or this customer's data. That's something really hard to, to code as, an, as a traditional access control check. But if you can have a policy service that can look up that information and determine the value of you know, a currently assigned a ticket that's relevant uh, as an attribute, you can then, you can then automate this. Um, so the biggest, uh, the biggest lesson learned that I can that I can pass along from having grappled with a bunch of concrete in, instantiations of most of these uh, is that you need to think beyond access. Um, many privacy policies are not just about who can access what, or security policies are about you know what groups somebody needs to be in, you know what kinds of ACLs are in place. They're about purposes and jurisdiction. There's a reason behind most of these rules, even if they ended up, even if they end up getting encoded in traditional, you know, ACL or clearance and authorization uh, frameworks. Um, and so if you dig down to the why, um, you can express them in more enclosed form if you can evaluate uh, these kinds of attributes more directly. And expectations, agreements, and regulations change. A layer of indirection here where you're calling a policy server, which takes all of the attributes in question, goes and looks up what the current policy is and, and evaluates that, makes it much easier to adapt. It makes it much easier to add or remove constraints as laws and, and regulations change, or as user expectations change, or you know, a company legal department says, we're gonna change our terms of service and ask people to, uh, to consent to that. Um, and so when you're looking at this, trying to automate some of these kinds of, of policies that are hard to implement and hard to automate using traditional methods, um, dig down, ask why. Um, things that are phrased as group membership or RBAC are often proxies for more abstract rules uh, that you can compute dynamically. 
that you can go look up in another system. You can correlate. Uh, you can write arbitrary amounts of code to go find the information it needs, compute what, how this policy should be evaluated right at this moment uh, and give uh, an answer based on that. Um, one aspect of this is this works best for policies that are executed infrequently by computer terms uh, on large amounts of data. So starting up an analysis job, you know, should this job start? Are all the conditions right or did someone make a mistake? Um, should this broad horizontal com computation involve all of these data sets or should we skip ones that don't fulfill such and such a condition, things like that. Uh, and if you can't, if you find you can't write a piece of code to evaluate a policy given all of these kinds of attributes, you know, ask what information's missing. Um, ask, you know, determine whether it can be recorded somewhere that a policy service can read it. Uh, this has come up in the past a number of times around consent, for example. Uh, if you ask the user a question about, can I use your, you know, can we use your data for this purpose? Record the answer. You know, it's not just a user interface prompt. It's it's recording something from from that user that should be referred to later on uh, when making policy decisions about data you know, collected from or about that user, for example. Um, and sometimes there are other systems that expose state that affect whether a policy applies. Uh, I used an example earlier of being assigned a, tr a trouble ticket. Another good example would be, say you have a site reliability engineer who's debugging a service that isn't working properly. Many organizations have a, uh, have a procedure called break glass where somebody can request extraordinary uh, authorization uh, while giving a reason and relying on basically auditing that later uh, so that they can get a service back up and running so that they can resolve a fault. Um, and having a way that that's exposed so you can record, yes, yeah, so-and-so invoked break glass uh, and applying to these systems, you know, bypass what would, what would normally be allowed to proceed is a good way to automate that without, without putting up lots of roadblocks in front of those kinds of operations, but still automating whatever you can uh, and recording it so that it can be audited later. Uh, and that's, looks like it's about time's up. So thank you very much. Um, I look forward to questions on Zoom and Slack during the conference. Um, you're also welcome to email me uh, afterwards at awalker at nuna.com and uh, happy to compare notes on this. Thanks a lot.